Hi, I'm Bob Orr, and this is Washington Unplugged. Today we're going to focus on the Obama administration and a number of foreign policy challenges. It seems to be trouble on just about all fronts, Pakistan, Iraq, Afghanistan, and Iran. On Afghanistan, we're still waiting for the president's decision on whether he's going to send more troops, and if so, how many. But last night, the White House surprised us a little bit when the president made a late trip to Dover Air Force Base to receive the remains of soldiers and DEA agents in which killed in Afghanistan earlier this week. Bill Plant's at the White House now, and he's here to talk about that. Bill, uh, what was this all about? What was the White House trying to do with this well, surprise you know, trip? Bob, I think they were trying to show that the president was willing to confront the reality of what's going on on the ground in Afghanistan as well as Iraq in a very solemn way. He went to Dover Air Force Base uh, in Dover, Delaware, where America's remains the remains of American service people come back to this country after they've been killed. And it was, a, it was a really unusual first for him. He's never done it before. He was there in the middle of the night uh, watching the transfer of 18 sets of remains and visiting with 14 of the families. They didn't tell us about this trip until uh, very late last night. It kind of came out of the blue. They, they meant indeed to keep it private and only the so-called press pool and the people who had already applied to cover the transfer got to go and got to see it. There were very few pictures, only pictures of the president, no casket unless the president is in the picture. But his spokesman, Robert Gibbs, who also went on the trip, told us today that the president has expressed a desire for some time to do this, and particularly to visit with the families to reassure them that as the commander in chief, he understands the sacrifice that their loved ones have made. And it seems pretty clear that the White House is drawing a distinction between the Obama administration and the administration of George W. Bush because this didn't happen then. Well, it's not unusual for presidents to welcome the remains of fallen Americans back. President Carter did it. President Reagan did it. Um, President George H.W. Bush did it until the first Gulf War when uh, he was instrumental, we believe, in getting the uh, armed forces to shut down any pictures or any publicity relating to the transfer of remains because he was having a news conference one day and there was a split screen of Americans' remains coming back on the other side of the screen at Dover, Delaware. So all through the uh, administration of his son, there were no pictures allowed. The Clinton administration allowed some, but it wasn't until the Obama administration that they finally opened it up again. And uh, even then, it's only with the consent of the families. Okay, Bill, one last uh, just quick note. Any late news on when we might hear the president's decision on troops? We're still being told that it probably won't come until after the vote in Afghanistan. Now, of course, the vote is going to happen on the 7th of November, but it will take weeks to know what the outcome is. So what they'll probably do is announce his decision after the voting on the 7th and before he leaves for Asia on the 10th, so early November. All right, uh, Bill Plan at the White House, thanks very much for joining us today. And joining me here at the desk now to talk about Afghanistan and other issues, David Sanger from the New York Times. David, thanks, and Juan Zarati, our uh, national security analyst. Let's start with Afghanistan. Uh, we saw trouble earlier this week in Kabul, uh, the assaults there uh, right on the eve of the elections. Uh, the president's in a tough spot here. How is all of this coming together to affect his decision, David? You know, I think the president's got to decide how much he lets a big strategic decision get affected by incidents which have been quite horrific over the past few days. And while it may or may not affect his decision, and I suspect he'll try to divorce himself from that, it certainly affects the political atmosphere into which he makes this decision. And should he decide to add more troops, and all the body language seems to be that they would, because as we've reported in recent days, they're moving toward a strategy of protecting the population centers, letting the Taliban have a little more freedom in the, in the rural areas. That would require more troops, and it will lead, I suspect, to a fair bit of opposition within his own party that you're already hearing. I mean, his problem here is the Democrats much more than the Republicans. Mm -hmm. What do you make, uh, Juan, of the president's trip to Dover last night? Does this play into this? What message was he sending? Well, I, I think, as, as Bill mentioned, it, it symbolizes the importance with which he takes not only our current effort and the c current commitment of the soldiers and civilians on the ground. Bear in mind, you had three DEA agents uh, who were a part of, uh, of the mission that uh, led to the death of uh, 14 individuals in one of the incidents. And so I think he wanted to, to send a clear message both in image and in word that 
Uh, he understands the seriousness of the mission. He understands the commitment that's being made. And he understands thereby the, the seriousness of his strategic decision that he's undertaking in terms of this, this decision in this review. And so I think that was an important moment for the president, and it shows that he's uh, obviously focused on the issue in a very concrete way. And he knew the pictures. The White House knew the pictures of the somber commander in chief would be playing everywhere today. And that sends a pretty powerful message. It does, you know, it sends a message, as Bill suggested earlier, that he is not divorcing this decision from an understanding of the, the incredible human cost here. And, you know, uh, President Bush made the decision not to go to any of these uh, return of remains, not because he was cold-hearted about it in any way, but because he was concerned that if you went to some and not to others, you immediately create some issues. I guess President Obama has just called that differently. Of course, Afghanistan is not the only uh, concerning spot. Across the border, Pakistan is still a problem. And some relatively amazing news this morning uh, with Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, Juan. Well, this, this is interesting. It, it appears, based on the AP report, that uh, Secretary Clinton has, in essence, called out the Pakistanis, uh, arguing that um, she is surprised that the Pakistanis have not been more effective and, and more able to ferret out and to find al-Qaeda senior leadership. Um, this is, if, if the report is it's accurate... It's kind of an astonishing statement, isn't it, from a, from a diplomatic leader like the Secretary of State? Well, to a certain extent, <clears throat> what's, what's astonishing about it is not necessarily the substance of it, because I think uh, many analysts would say that, uh, you know, the ISI, the Intelligence Service of Pakistan, does in fact have more knowledge p perhaps about uh, al-Qaeda's activities, especially in western Pakistan or, or nor northwestern parts of Pakistan. But the problem here is the timing. Uh, we're seeing Pakistan literally under assault from uh, the Taliban, the Pakistan Taliban and al-Qaeda, uh, daily bombings uh, at a time when the Pakistanis have basically taken ownership and have started to take ownership in an important and good way for U.S. interests of this very fight. And for her to say this at this moment uh, will certainly rankle uh, the senior most leadership uh, in Islamabad. Uh, and, and may create some tension that perhaps wasn't necessary at this point. And I thought she was going there specifically to try to get the two governments together to kind of... Well, she's ha she had a big problem to tamp down because the legislation that just got signed into law by President Obama on aid to Pakistan imposes a series of conditions on the Pakistanis. There's some question about how rigorously they would be enforced, but everything from access to A.Q. Khan, the man who, mm -hmm. uh, the Pakistani who helped uh, arm Iran, Iran uh, right, uh, and, and North Korea and others, but also a much more effective counterterrorism approach. And so she's got to be able to certify to Congress each year that they are seriously going to do this. And as Juan suggested, you know, the history of the past seven years has been the ISI and to some degree the military fighting both sides of this war. You know, mm -hmm. Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays against the Taliban, and uh, Tuesdays and Thursdays supporting at least some of their efforts in southern Afghanistan for fear that if the United States leaves, they're in the position then of needing a proxy force to keep India out of southern Pakistan, out of southern Afghanistan. And that's what this is all about. And she's basically saying, it's not just that you have to take up this war, you have to go at it full force and continuously. And I think they're clearly concerned right now that good as this effort in recent days has been, there is no evidence that it will necessarily be lasting. And before we go, let's talk about Iran. David, you've written extensively about this. Uh, it, it looks from press reports like Iran is backtracking now on any kind of deal that would involve shipping out uranium, uh, enriched uranium. What's happening here? Uh, the deal that they, uh, Obama administration, hoped it had negotiated with the Iranians last week in, in Vienna, and I, I was over there for these negotiations, would have bought the West some time because it would have required the Iranians to ship a good deal of their stockpile of uranium out to Russia for re-enrichment for use in a medical reactor, and then it would come back into Iran. The Iranians don't trust that it would come back, and they want to send this fuel out a little bit at a time. Well, the problem with that is it would mean that they would retain enough of a stockpile for roughly one bomb's worth of uranium. And so it wouldn't buy that time that was the only thing that President Obama was seeking. But it may look to the rest of the world like they're cooperating just enough to forestall sanctions. It may be a very savvy move. Are we being played here? I mean, is the West being played? Well, th that's the great challenge and question here. And, and it all boils down to a question of trust. Uh, do we believe that the Iranians 
will in good faith negotiate away their nuclear program or their nuclear ambitions, whether it's a weapons program or otherwise. Uh, and I think the jury is still out, and I think most of the, of the Western negotiators and Western governments don't believe that Iran is actually, at the end of the day, willing to give up its nuclear program. So I think, based on what we're seeing, I think we're seeing the Iranians be extremely savvy. They're buying time. They're trying to buy diplomatic space uh, so that harsh sanctions won't be imposed and so that there will be, to a certain extent, a fracturing of the coalition against them. Uh, and I think this presents a great challenge for the Obama administration because uh, it it calls into question whether or not uh, the engagement strategy can work with Iran. It also brings into question questions of timing. For example, the French have talked about the end of December being the deadline, in, in essence, for Iran to demonstrate that it's willing to cooperate with the West. What does this signal? It's not clear. And what happens at the end of December if, in fact, uh, we haven't come to some negotiated solution, at least on this part of the, of the deal? Um, I think it's a tough situation. And just quickly, David, what's your guess? Where do you think this goes? My guess is that this goes to stalemate. And, you know, the clock here that's running is partly the West threatening sanctions. But there's an Israeli clock that's ticking here as well. And the Israelis have said that they would give President Obama until the end of the year to make progress on the Iranian issue. That unspoken part of that sentence is that come next year, they would reconsider the kind of military action that they considered at the end of the Bush administration when they came to President Bush and asked him for the bunker-busting weapons and for the overflight rights over Iraq and the refueling capability they would need to take out the Iranian sites. Big challenges on all fronts. David Sanger, New York Times, thanks for coming by. Thank Juan, you. Good to see you again. Thanks, thanks for stopping by. And now quickly about politics, we turn to the race for governor in New Jersey. Where just six weeks ago, the challenger Chris Christie enjoyed about an eight-point lead in the polls over the incumbent governor John Corzine. Well, the polls now have closed, and the race is a statistical tie, perhaps thanks to an infusion of money and negative ads. John Bentley took a look. If you didn't pay your taxes, ignored ethics laws. Voters you say they hate them. It? Chris Christie. Politicians Corzine. say they're necessary. Tax failure. They may be tough, but I think they are contrasts. And I think on the issues that matter to the voter, we're on the right side. They're the John attack Corzine ads that clog the airwaves around the every election. He promised he would put us first. So why do they always seem to crop up? Wrong when it matters most. Because they work. To the extent that it's become closer now, that's in effect many things. You've got a lot of advertising, a lot of awareness, and also a lot of partisans probably coming home to their respective camps. Not to mention a lot of money. Governor Corzine has chosen to pay for his campaign and his expensive television commercials John Corzine has out of his own pocket. And that gives him a leg up in the race, according to Princeton professor Nolan McCarty. New Jersey is a very expensive state to run in, not only is it an expensive state in general, but it doesn't have its own media market. So when a gubernatorial candidate wants to buy time on TV, they have to go either into New York or to Philadelphia, which are two of the most expensive media markets, and oftentimes they have to buy time on both of those. So the, the immense resources that uh, John Corzine brings to the table really does give him an advantage. I stand with them. Corzine says he was forced into running the ads by outside groups helping his opponent. If you look at just uh, what Mr. Christie is able to spend, you might see uh, some difference in what is going on. But if you put together what outside money from the Republican Governors Association is, uh, it's about an equivalent. You're balancing the scales, is that what We're you're trying to balance the scales, absolutely. But Corzine is receiving help from outside groups as well. He's also not limited in what he can spend on the race by campaign finance laws, the way Christie is, because he is self-financing his campaign. Hey, guys. Corzine has a very large financial advantage. Um, in recent uh, campaign reports that have just come out, he is outspending Chris Christie at, at this point by a fairly substantial margin. How big a margin? The latest campaign finance reports show Corzine outspending Christie $24 million to $9 million in the general election. Everybody feels really badly for our poor governor um, who feels as if he's being outspent. But if it's typical for what he spent in other campaigns, he will outspend me three to one. Um, no matter how much any other group spends. Corzine has made it worse. Despite running some Corzine negative ads himself, Christie is also trying to stake out the moral Christie's high ground by criticizing the negative campaigning. I hope you're as sick and tired of all these negative commercials as I am. I think the race has gotten a little nasty, in part because of the money involved and because the kind of the spending has been focused on kind of negative campaigning. So how that plays out, 
asked whether on net, you know, the governor benefits or, or loses from that type of campaign, I think she has to be seen. Another thing that hasn't been seen here in 12 years, a Republican governor. Christie's lead in the polls has all but vanished, and he and Governor Corzine are now locked in a dead heat. And that may be good news for the governor, because only two incumbents have been voted out of office here in the past 50 years. John Bentley, CBS News, Trenton, New Jersey. And thanks to you for watching Washington Unplugged today. Of course, you can find us here every weekday at 12.30 p.m. on cbsnews.com. I'm Bob Orr. Have a good day. Mm -hmm.